Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I am, as you know, Masood Raja, and today we are here uh, for our seventh session in our course on postcolonialism. And today we'll generally be talking about Franz Fanon. And uh, Fanon, you know, is really crucial and important for post-colonial studies, but also for uh, a lot of liberation movements, including the Black Panthers in United States and civil rights movement. And uh, one of the most important scholars to know if you are into scholarship of resistance as well as post-colonial studies scholarship in general. So just a bit of a backstory. So Fanon was born and raised in Martinique, which is considered and was considered an old French colony. By that, what was meant was that it was a French colony established before, uh, of course, the French Revolution. And pretty much the majority of the population were the slaves who were brought from Africa to work on the plantations. And uh, the language at the time of Fanon was, of course, the official language was French, and that's what he grew up with. And uh, that's what heavily influenced his own thought. And then he goes on to study psychoanalysis, becomes a practitioner of psychoanalysis, goes to France, and that's where you know, he has this existential experience. And as a psychoanalyst, based on that, then he starts tracking how his identity came to be and, you know, what does it mean for him? And so there are four books by Fanon, but of course the first and the most important is The Black Skin, White Masks, then is Our Dying Colonialism, and then The Wretched of the Earth, one of the most cited Fanon texts. But uh, I mean, you can look up the chronology of the books right here. Black Skin, White Masks was published in French in 1952, A Dying Colonialism in 1959, The Wretched of the Earth in 1961. And then there is the Towards an African Revolution. But by and large, the most discussed books of Fanon are Black Skin, White Masks, and The Wretched of the Earth. And we'll start with Black Skin, White Masks and go into like the general aspects of Fanon's theory. And so that's what we'll be doing today. But let me welcome all of you. We have Oroko. Um, so, okay. He's here, welcome. Anum is here, welcome. And anyone else who posts their names up there, I'll welcome you all as well. So uh, a lot of people trace Fanon's personal experience to, uh, you know, when he goes to France, he has no identity other than a French subject. That's the only identity he knows, that he's a Frenchman, speaks French, studied French, studied in French. And when he goes to France for the first time, he sees a young girl with her mom pointing to him and saying to her mother, oh, mom, look, a black man. And Fanon had never thought of himself as a black man. So, so he suddenly realizes this identity that is being attributed to him that for him does not exist. So that shatters the identity that he had structured as a colonial subject. And he realizes that there is nothing else for him to retrieve from. How do you construct an identity, you know, when you deep down after the performative identity is shattered, what replaces it? And so that's one, uh, and then of course his experiences in a racialized space where he's treated differently, even though he has the same level of expertise as his French co, uh, you know, French counterparts. And that gets him thinking about the question of African identity, questions of black identity. So the black skin white masks was the first book that addresses in his oeuvre that addresses that question. 
And I always also cite its opening, right? Um, because it's even in translation, it is one of the most, uh, what you could say, um, poetic openings of any book, right? The explosion will not happen today. It is too soon or too late. I do not come with timeless truths. My consciousness is not illuminated with ultimate radiances. Nevertheless, in complete composure, I think it would be good if certain things were said. These things I'm going to say, not shout, for it is a long time since shouting, shouting has gone out of my life so very long. Why write this book? No one has asked me for it, especially those to whom it is directed. Well, well, I reply quite calmly that there are too many idiots in this world. And having said it, I have the burden of proving it toward a, a new humanism, understanding among men, our colored brothers, mankind. I believe in you, race prejudice, to understand and to love. So the, the project of the book then is to explore African psyche, right? What happens to you? What kind of traumas you experience within a colonial system or within a racialized system? And he is fairly Lacanian here and relies on Freud on how the psyche develops and how the Oedipus complex is resolved. So his idea, main idea in The Wretched of the Earth is to trace the trauma caused by the colonial experience, but also that the resolution of the Oedipus complex for a black subject is problematic because in, when he enters the law of the father, which happens in the social world, the father figure whose law he must adapt adopt or adapt to is not the real father, not the black father, but is superimposed by the white father, right? The law of the colonizers, the law of the white dominant group. And it is that trauma, you know, then, then that causes the resolution is impossible because the only way you can resolve an Oedipus complex like that is to surrender yourself to a foreign power to a foreign law. And so that's the trauma that he traces throughout this book. And the chapters are interestingly, you know, entitled like that. You, If you look at the table of contents, the Negro and language, the woman of color and the white man, and the man of color and the white woman, and the so-called dependency complex of colonized peoples the fact of blackness, the Negro and psychopathology, the Negro and recognition, and then the conclusion. Now, the conclusion of the book is really poetic as well, but also slightly misleading, right? So after he has argued how the black psyche is impacted by, by the colonial violence, right, and by the the law of the privileged white minority in Martinique, for example. What he's arguing towards is a kind of new humanism. That's what he calls it. What kind of a new humanism? A new humanism that incorporates the African aspects of identity within it and doesn't just offer the European humanism as universal, right? But a new humanism that is neither dependent on a Eurocentric view of humanity or built on a history of grievances by the African subjects. So he's like, I don't want to dwell on history. I don't want the history to articulate my future. So let's forget about what you did to me and move on. But I don't also want to subscribe to a singular universalist Eurocentric view of humanism. So the kind of humanity that he sees then is which incorporates both without conflict. And he says, I want the world to recognize with me the open door of every consciousness. That is second to last sentence of the book. My final prayer, 
Oh, my body, make me always a man who questions. And then there are quite a few assertions in this conclusion. I, the man of color, want only this, that the tool never possesses the man, that the enslavement of man by man ceases forever, that is, of one by another, that it be possible for me to discover and to love man wherever he may be. So you can see that there is a certain universalist tendency here, but a universalist tendency not necessarily Eurocentric because he has given us an account of the black psyche in the book, which incorporates that experience, right? And alters it to a point where there are no universal truths proposed by one dominant group only. But the group that is fighting this oppression and this psychic trauma is also encouraged not to rely heavily on grievances or historical injustices, but to look beyond that to create a new kind of humanism. And I think that is really instructive for us. Uh, a lot of people who do post-colonial studies kind of in a haphazard way, even though they are challenging the binaries, they themselves keep relying on a universal binaristic structure, right? And, uh, and and so they start mobilizing these generalizations, you know, West and East. I mean, the idea is to break those generalizations, right? To, to point out whatever dominance the West so-called has, but to also realize that West is not a monolith anymore, just as the East was never a monolith. Another thing to keep in mind is that the ending, this the phenon of the black skin white mass at the end is a completely different phenon from the beginning of the wretched of the earth. By the time he publishes the wretched of the earth, he is heavily involved in the Algerian freedom movement and he joins FLN, but he doesn't just join FLN, he joins the most radical branch of FLN. So Fanon of the Wretched of the Earth is the Fanon who has now had the experiences in the colony, who is now trying to trace what happens to the Arab subject under colonized situation, right? And how does he so-called Arab subject, the African subject, what is the path of recovery? How do you gain your full humanity, right? And that is the subject of the wretched of the earth, which is more revolutionary in nature and which was more widely read as a book. So I'm gonna pause here and welcome a few more people and then uh, see what you all say or if you have any questions so far. So I don't have any comments, but I have uh, Saqib has joined us, welcome. And you know, there are eight people here. So if you wouldn't mind just posting a comment so that I know who's here. But anyway, um, I'm open to questions here. But while you're coming up with that, I'll move on to uh, you know the some more uh, historical information about Fanon. So Fanon applies to go and work in Algeria. Now, remember, Algeria was a French colony, but French never thought of it as a separate part of France. They, they thought of it as an integral part of France. And there was a huge French settler population in Algeria. And so they developed kind of a unique culture where the French living in Algeria thought of themselves as French and thought of Algeria as part of French, but that society, of course, was divided amongst the settlers and the Arab and Berber population and African population, and there was a minority Jewish population as well. So when Fanon goes to Algeria as a psychiatrist, he's given the Arab ward, right? That is his charge. And he then launches a lot of reform. He introduces social therapy, builds a small mosque there, uh, has a cafe built in into his ward so that the patients who were being treated there and all the patients, of course, suffering from 
mental ailments so that they can have a, a simulation of a social life. And he has great success with that. But at a certain stage, he realizes that when his patients leave the hospital, right, they relapse into the same traumas that they came in with, which teaches him empirically that the thing that is causing these psychological traumas is the very culture in which the Arab subjects live. And that is this inquiry, wretched of the earth, is what, do, what happens to you if you live in a colonial situation which is violent, that that violence will then impact you. And so in order to cure anyone of paranoia or other mental ailments, you can't just do it clinically in a hospital. You must change the system itself that is causing that psychological trauma. So that is the basic argument in the wretched of the earth. So then when he goes on to explain violence, right, what his idea, and this is where a lot of people indict Fanon for being the philosopher of violence, but they never really understand that what he's talking about is within the context of colonial violence and psycho psychoanalysis or psychology. So what he's saying is in the beginning part of the book, he's tracing the desire of the native subject and its suppression, right? That first of all, the male subject who's in the public sphere is emasculated by the European law, is told to stay in his place. And right in front of his eyes is a community that is created. It's, it has order, beautiful boulevards and all. So you have created a place of desire which this person cannot have. And then you have violently told this person, this is your place in society. And that order is maintained through violence, right? So in terms of the psyche, that place across the street from the kasbah becomes the place of desire. And if you can, argue, if you can convince yourself that that was your land, your place, right? then the desire to oust those who have it and replace them with yourself is ultimately a psychological desire, which will be generated in this subject. Now, since the colonial system, according to Fanon, is a violent system, relies on brutality, police and others to keep the natives in check, the only way psychologically for these men to claim their full humanity is to literally overthrow their masters, right? To evict them from that land. That is why when you read his essay concerning violence, that is what it's talking about. Not necessarily that we must be violent, but that if you really want to see this human psyche which has been suppressed and which causes trauma and which has been violated through violence, the only way out of it is by overthrowing the people who have done that. And that is the project of the wretched of the earth, right? So as I said, by this time, he was already part of the FLN and uh, and he was already involved in the most radical part of the FLN. Uh, now, do also keep in mind that the Algerian freedom movement was one of the most brutal wars of independence that was fought. Okay, so the French, French un unleashed their entire military force and special services to, you know, suppress the uprising. About two million people died in that. Okay. And then at the end, after the Pied Noir, the, the French settlers leave, okay? They don't just leave, they burn everything that they had built, the hospitals, the schools, the infrastructure. They completely destroy it to a point that the Algerians have to pretty much rebuild the infrastructure. And so Algerian freedom movement was also interesting because part of it was leftist. Uh, but they also mobilized, you know, a purist religious identity, of course, which comes to haunt them afterwards in the place of women in that, even though women actively participated in, in the struggle. But that's the backdrop in which the wretched of the earth has been written. Now, a cautionary note, when you use your phenomenon, right, 
know the difference. Are you quoting early Fanon? If you are, then mention it there that you are aware that the Fanon of the wretched of the earth is on a different trajectory, still dealing with the psyche, but also involved in a liberation struggle. So that's the distinction between the two books. So let me welcome some more people and see if there are any questions. So I have Chetali, welcome. Hamna Bajwa, welcome. And then Muhammad Awas, also welcome. And uh, Amina Ijaz, thank you for your today. Just wondering if people like C CLR James are aware of Fanon writing while writing Black Jacobins. Yes, they are all aware. They are reading each other. Um, Fanon was read by everyone in the 60s. Now, if, if you're talking about CLR James' works before 1953, maybe not. But most of the later Harlem, Harlem Renaissance people were aware of Fanon. The Black Panthers had read him. Che had read him. Pretty much every other freedom movement in Africa that comes post-1954, they had read Fanon. So he was very carefully read by a lot of uh, black activists and uh, you know freedom uh, black struggle freedom struggle people okay so these are like some of my ideas about fanon and then one of the essays chapters that i really teach from the wretched of the earth is uh, the fanon speech and his two chapters, The Pitfalls of National Consciousness and On National Culture. And the one on national culture is a more developed version, but it's also important to read this essay, especially if you um, want to discuss the debates of nationalism. Now, this essay, chapter, of course, was written in response to the Negritude movement which was led by people like uh, Damas and uh, Senor and others. Now, what the Negritude movement people believed in is was that Africa should become independent and then it should become United States of Africa. They were pan-Africanists. -Africa what Fanon is arguing here is that, yes, we can be that later, but first we must develop national consciousness, because he sees that as a prerequisite to building larger alliances. And Fanon is also not culturalist, whereas most of the Negritude movement people were culturalists. So what Fanon is suggesting here is that how does the national consciousness emerge? So he gives three stages of national consciousness and mobilization. The first stage is when the native elite learn the languages of their masters and start producing works in the languages of their masters, right? Which are European in nature, use the European tropes and forms, right? In the second stage, the native writers and artists turn to their own culture and start retrieving their own art, their own art forms, clay, working with stones, writing, and then in the third stage, which is the stage before the rise of national movements, is when the native authors in Fanon's word uh, express the heart of the people, right? That is when they start writing the literature of combat. And that literature is mostly either in native languages and it exhorts the people to fight for their rights. So these are the three stages which are very important in understanding how Fanon articulates it, because if you're doing post-colonial work and you want to place what stage of evolution, let's say, a certain book is, you can go back to Fanon and cite him and bring about, you know, if R.K. Narayan is writing, which stage of native production it is. And then what is the combat literature? How is it produced? How it is perpetuated? So that's another important chapter in Fanon that I highly recommend. Uh, okay, so questions. Sayyid Saqib Ahmed, Mike. Mike. Let me put your question up. My question is kind of out of the context, but you can answer it at the end. Of, there were, was an election a few days ago in one of the French colonies on the liberation. And uh, 
most of the people voted to stay with France. How does post? Well, I mean, uh, it's not post-colonialism's job to answer these questions. Post-colonialism is not a revolutionary movement. Every post-colony or colonial situation has its own peculiar politics and people's own interests. If you're talking about today, every uh, group of people always has a people who whose interests are aligned with the dominant power. And then people can also now see where their interest lies. Would they be more uh, free if they became independent or would it be better for them to stay aligned with a larger entity? These are all the complex questions of any people. Now in the 50s and 60s, the choice was different. The choice was, do we oust these people who are here and run our country and tell us what to do? In comparison to now, where either these Martinique is st still a French territory, right? Because now they have their local autonomous governments and they see their part of being the British Commonwealth or everything else um, being, uh, you know, uh, an advantage. So, but in any case, you have to see what are the particular conditions of existence in a given island or a given territory, what kind of politics is there, who, you know, what are the numbers? And I don't see post-colonialism trying to answer all these questions. But as I mentioned, post-colonialism is not a monolithic field of study. It depends on what you're studying, which region, which theorists you're using, and then you then decide, you know, where you're going to use it to read what situation. Um, I mean, you would see this happening uh, even in, in Puerto Rico. I mean, they also voted whether they want to be a state or not a state. So politics in place are, I think, more complex than just trying to render them with post-colonial theory. Uh, and do keep in mind that even though we use the term post-colonialism, you know, post-colonialism is not a course, it's not a syllabus, it's not a concept alone. It is a praxis and it involves different ways of dealing with colonial experience or post-colonial experience. Some of us uh, focus on gender and in even that you have to be specific where. Some of us focus on globalization, neoliberalism, its impact, but even that has to be traced depending on, on where you are. Uh, so I have never used post-colonialism as an umbrella term or as a revolutionary politics, right? Um, it also, if you read Fanon, will depend on what level of development is national consciousness in a certain territory in order to know, you know, how they respond to past and present colonial imperatives. And, and most importantly, where their interests are aligned. And okay, good. Any other questions? Hina Mir, welcome. Okay, good. So I think I welcomed everyone. And uh, so in ways of using Finon, uh, you know, then, the, the, then there is a dying colonialism and it is the most important essay in that is Algeria Unveiled, which is Fanon's reading of the veil itself and how the veil in certain um, circumstances is reversed, right? And made into a tool uh, of revolution itself, how women become active in the Algerian civil war and how and so if you ever want to read a, a good secular reading of the veil and what does it do in Algerian culture, that's a good example of it. Now, going off of Fanon, another interesting thing to keep in mind is um, in Algeria, and this happens in a lot of uh, colonial struggles uh, in India, you know, Pakistan, uh, what happens is that if if the national struggle retrieves pre-colonial modes of thinking and doing things, most of the times they go to religious past, religious identities. And what ends up happening is they mobilize those to fight their freedom struggle, right? And by jettisoning any Western influences. If you read Partha Chatterjee's Nation and its fragments, 
he explains that how nationalism develops in the private sphere and the figure of the woman becomes deeply prominent and in the early dramas of 19th century India in Bengal you see uh, the native woman the carrier of culture and honor of India or Bengal juxtaposed against this comical figure who is the figure of the westernized woman right and who's made fun of on the stage but it also inscribes the idea of the native woman as domesticated as pure as highly religious you know a prophetess who gives her life for the country but then in the post colony that figure of the woman then becomes the prescription for how women ought to be right and that becomes the dilemma of the post colonial space it happens in algeria right the islamists come back and then they want women to be the kind of women that they had projected in the revolutionary movement right um, hijab wearing women who stay home and sustain the nation so there are reactionary responses also because of colonialism that come to haunt the nation state uh, and this idea uh, of retrieving something pure in the past happens in africa as well happens um, in asia happens in most muslim countries uh, because it's a purest retrieval and it's a pre-modern retrieval then it reinscribes women in the private sphere and that sphere like i've always argued that there is no pure retrieval there should be no pure retrieval and if you want to indigenize your knowledge you know then you must take what is available in the world and and tame it and incorporate it in your culture but only if it becomes more liberatory right and if if it is geared towards more equality these are some of the things that we can think through as post colonialists hana would you please like to talk a little more on fanon in the wretched of the earth so yeah i would love to but what particular part of the wretched of the earth uh, the purpose is never to read a whole book and talk about it um, but uh, like if if you read concerning violence that is the most important part of the book right what he does in 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 this chapter concerning violence which is a great explanation of how a violent system is established right and and the good thing about fanon is that he's not just giving us the material causes of how a system of violence of colonial violence is established but he also is giving us the psychological trauma caused by it what does it do right and then how to respond to it you know like here is a sentence the natives are convinced that their fate is in the balance here and now they live in the atmosphere of doomsday and they consider that nothing ought to be let pass unnoticed that is why they understand very well and then he goes like basically what he is giving us is not just an historical account or even a theoretical account but also what happens in a violent system psychologically even though if it is an economic violence or military violence and what does it do to the psyche of those who are either fighting against it or or are living in that situation right so that's why concerning violence to me uh, is kind of the heart of the book if you read it carefully um, it will give you a lot of insights into the psychological aspects of violence or a violent political system along with how it is established and how does it work uh, so let's say if you wanted to write about not just post colonialism if you just wanted to write about epistemic violence in any given society post colonial society what does it do to women's consciousness right you could read concerning violence because it gives you the key into explaining what a violent situation may it be physical violence or epistemic violence what kind of subjectivities does it create what is the subjectivity of the so called victim and what would it take for that victim through solidarity with others to fight back 
and claim their full humanity. Now, I always also encourage my students to read Fanon along with Paulo Freire, because Freire is also talking about revolution and a kind of revolution that creates equal human beings. His method is through didactics, through teaching. But one thing that we learn from Fanon, uh, from Freire, is this idea is how to create a revolutionary subjectivity that is freedom loving, but that does not become oppressor when it has won the freedom, right? And that's a question that Fanon doesn't really answer. But this is how we read one work and see how it infuses another or how we can bring them into conversation. So here is, uh, whenever we talk about post-colonial literature, or call, we must find a certain kind of violence in it. Yes, I mean, if, if you look at any colonial situation, these were systems established through military, military force or through economic force and then through epistemic violence. What is epistemic violence? Epistemic violence is when you overwrite any given culture with your own body of knowledge, your own body of laws, to a point that they can't even recall what they used to be. That is an act of epistemic violence because you've shifted their episteme or stymied the growth of their episteme. That's what also happens in colonialism. So if, if you are studying colonialism, you can read the colonial violence, but also how do they create a compredor class in any given society, a class that works in the interest of the colonizers and oppresses their own people. And then in the post-colony, after the colonizers have less left, are those systems still intact, those systems of violence, those systems of oppression? So if you look at India and Pakistan, Right? I mean, India, I don't know much about Pakistan. The infrastructure is still the same. The civic in infrastructure is still the same. Uh, the districts and the towns are still run by unelected bureaucrats who have absolute power, right? And they uh, live the same kind of lifestyle that the British civil servants live. They used to be called deputy collectors. We call them deputy commissioners. Those power structures have not been replaced by elected people. Now, the difference between having a bureaucrat run a system and a politician is that by the end of the day, if his constituency is small enough or her constituency, then he or she will be answerable to the people and maybe more accessible. Well, it's hit and trial, takes a long time, but that is the idea behind it. So the colonizers left but they still left their system back. And that system is still intact. The way the police treat the citizens or deal with them is also was put in place during the colonial times. Now think of uh, all the other oppressive systems that exist in your nation. You can trace their lineage to the colonial system and then see how would they need to be altered to make them more responsive to people and more accountable to the people. Um, there are a lot of studies also about the colonies where most of the post colonies that inherit established military forces. There's a wonderful Marxist essay from the 60s on it. I think it, I'm forgetting the name of the scholar, uh, which tells you that the reason all these nations have had dictatorships was because in most post colonies, the militaries were highly developed. They were better funded. They had a developed infrastructure. And whereas the civil infrastructure needed to be built from the ground up in so many cases. So that's why in so many of these developing nations, militaries have constantly intervened. Then their psyche was developed differently as an institution when the British used the Indian troops against Indians themselves, they gave them a limited pride. They gave them a disdain for the civilian population, distrust of the civilian systems of government, and made them pretty much self-sufficient. Now, in terms of an episteme, these military organizations carry that episteme into the post-colonial system. 
right? And so the difference you can see. All of these things we can study under post-colonialism, how to change the local system of government. You can go to the rights of women, right? And, and then retrieve, okay, if we totally jettison the colonial influences or the West and retrieve instead the purest way of looking at how women ought to behave, then it always devolves into some kind of a religious retrieval. And so these are the questions that we need to ask, right? Um, and they, I, or, oh, or, oh, in Kenya, there is still fear of the police. This phobia has not changed since the establishment of Kenya. Yeah, and in so many cases, it's uh, if you look at the senior police officers anywhere, uh, most of the times these senior civil servants, they come from very prominent and powerful families, those that were established by the colonizers. So in so many ways, um, they are already connected to the power structure and the interest of that power structure is still in line uh, with the former colonies. That's why Ungugi Tiango's Devil on the Cross is such an amazing novel because it shows us, you know, through fictional characters as to how the elite in any given post-colonial state are still part of the same power structure. Their desires are still in the metropolitan and most of the times they're serving the interest of their masters, former and current, at the cost of their own people. Uh, and these are the living legacies of colonialism, right? So Fanon is helpful, in my opinion, in understanding the trauma of colonialism, especially in Africa, but elsewhere as well. What does, what kind of violences are involved in a colonial experience? And then psychologically, what does it do to the psyche of an Arab subject or an African subject, right? And then what does it take in terms of overthrowing the colonizers? It's not just political overthrow, it's also claiming your own humanity in the process, right? So that you can become a, a subject who can define socially his or her own place in that society without adopting someone else's mandates to perform a certain identity. You can take that and then deal with issues of women's rights, right? And uh, all of this can be made possible with a careful reading of Fanon, right? And putting him in conversation uh, with others, with other scholars. I mean, one mistake that I encourage my students not to make is to think that post-colonialism is kind of a monolith lithic study with a stable, you know, uh, me medium with a stable list of what we can do with it. Post-colonialism, as long as you are focused on issues of power and how does it impact human lives and human bodies, whether it is colonial or post-colonial, you can use post-colonial theory depending on which theories you use. And Fanon is important in that sense. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions or suggestions for future? Um, I mean, I'm not teaching it as an organized course because we have not done any fiction or stuff and this cannot really replicate that. This is a different medium and you are a different audience. Uh, but I do encourage you also to take a look at my website, postcolonial.net, which has a lot of specimen syllabi that I use in my classes, but a lot of other resources. And, uh, and then, you know, make use of them. But that's all I've got today. Oh, welcome. Thank you, jo Jonathan. Cool. And uh, yeah, most of our uh, weekly people are here. And uh, now uh, do keep in mind that I, I think I'm going to take a break next Saturday and not do anything. 
so we will not have a, a meeting next Saturday, but I will decide what we are going to do and I'll post it in the community section, but also on my website. And the last Saturday, of course, I am going to do a different webinar for the members of the channel. And, uh, and that's what I'll be dealing with. OK, Sanya, have you discussed Homi Baba? Yeah, uh, no. Um, I, I, I have plans of discussing Homi Baba, but not anytime soon, because to be very honest, Baba is one of the hardest theorists for me to read and uh, write about. And if I'm going to talk about him in public, I will have to really, really reread him and understand him more carefully. So he's not on my immediate list. And the simple reason isn't that I don't find him important. The simple re reason is that I need to do it when I absolutely feel prepared for this. OK. We have Alex. This is the first lecture I've joined. This is awesome. Thank you so much for your valuable insight. You're welcome. And please keep in mind that uh, we do this pretty much every Saturday. And if you're not sure, just look at the community section of the channel, and the announcement is always there with a link which you can join on Saturday. And then I have Chetali. Thank you so much. Uh, and and quite a few people. Good. So also, yeah, if you find these useful, of course, pass it on to others so that more people can join us. Uh, but also, uh, do keep an eye on the channel. Because uh, as I was checking yesterday, I think I now have about 375 videos on different topics. So if you just do a channel search, not a general search on any topic, chances are a lot of things will show up related to literary theory and post-colonial theory. And you can make use, use of those resources. Uh, resources. Uh, and, and you know help me promote all these things so that more people can use them. All right, any other questions on Fanon or anything in general? Because then if not, then I will you know kind of call it off and take some ref rest before my class at 1. So. OK, so also keep in mind that uh, I'm open to suggestions. As long as it's something that is in my area of expertise and that I can confidently uh, you know, handle, I will try to do that. Oroko has a question. What is the name? Most African writers have always dropped their Christian names. What is your take on this? Because they still write in their. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you're from Kenya. You could uh, actually put us wise because, you know, like uh, Ngugi used to be James Ngugi. So he changed his name. Uh, similarly, from Nigeria, Chinwe Zhu changed his name also to his native name. I don't know what the significance of that is, what to read into it. I mean, politically, I can understand it because if Nogugi, uh, for example, if he's arguing that the native Kenyan authors should write in their own language, I think it's a big statement for him to say, OK, I'm going to renounce my Christian name. And uh, performatively, then he can say, this is my name, and this is the language I will write in. Uh, and I think this happens a lot in African cultures, because the tragedy there was that most African cultures didn't have a written script. And the stories were passed on from one generation to another, right? These were oral cultures. So when that is disrupted, it became easier for the colonizers. The missionaries were the first ones who went in there to convert people. And you know, in two or three generations, people forget where they came from. Uh, this tragedy didn't happen that deeply, I would say, in the Arab world or in India, because they already had highly developed written scripts and texts and all. But even there, too, I mean, you know, India and Pakistan have a 
uh, India especially have a large uh, con um, population that converted to Christianity. Uh, the strange thing you see in Pakistan is that they would still have Muslim names, uh, you know, Aslam and so and so, but they would add Masi at the end to, um, you know, declare that they are Christians. But I don't know why these prominent figures have decided to do so. I mean, uh, uh, so good. So let's see. So my official name is Job Agutu, yet I use my grandfather's pet name, Oreko, just to have an identity. And through this, I'm, yeah, I think that is absolutely crucial. Because, I mean, think of it this way, like, if you just say, uh, my name is Steven, so and so, yeah, you it is still you, right? But if you really wanted to connect to your native culture, even symbolically, right? Uh, I think naming is crucial naming yourself, but also your children. Like if you're Yaruba, then have a Yaruba name. You know, if you're Gikuyu, use a Gikuyu name. And that identity matters because uh, even if it is perfunctory and doesn't serve any deep purpose, right? But it makes you curious, people curious. For example, like a lot of people who come to United States, um, especially if they are from China or uh, Korea, they usually take on uh, na American names, right? They will give themselves a nickname to make it easier for people maybe to call them by that American name. But on the other hand, the cost of that is that you personally don't lose that identity. But I would rather, you know, call you by your cultural name, right? Uh, uh, because that kind of announces you know, it's just like Masood Raja coming from Pakistan. And, you know, if I become James here so that it's easier for people to call me, there is no loss because I know I'm Masood Raja. But I think performatively, performatively names matter, right? And, and because they are part of your identity, the way you name yourself. You might have noticed post 1960s um, in African American culture over here after the civil rights movement, a lot of African Americans started looking for African names for their children, right? To give them those names in a way was to claiming the lost heritage that they had, right? So it it, it can be a huge political dis. I mean, think of it, Obama, right? Barack Obama, the first part of his name is Arabic, right? The middle name is Barack Hussein Obama. Obama is the family name that comes uh, from Nigeria, right? from Kenya or Nigeria, I'm not sure. But so, I mean, think of it, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, if he had born in F, he could be James, he could be Nicholas, right? But that choice, in a way, the naming of a child, right? With the last name that is African, with the first name that is Arabic, it has a significance, I think, in my opinion. Okay, I'll 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 try it. Adu on Netflix. Uh, okay, then OS due to poor int there is repetition. Okay, sorry. Uh, can Oroko suggest to us some good? American uh, African movies that can give us taste of African culture and Oroko say, says try um, try Adu on Netflix. Okay, so good. O Obama is a Luo name in Kenya. Okay, good, good. So see, it's not just you learning things from me. I am learning a lot from all of you too. Um, good. So okay. Um, and please feel free to suggest anything through comments on any of the videos. I always respond to the comments. And uh, I hope this was useful to you. And uh, I hope you can join us uh, every Saturday except next because I'm taking a rest next Saturday. And other than that, you know, I think we have dealt with all, all the questions today. So I'll beg you leave. And I will now uh, see you all next time when we announce a talk, right? 
And so thank you so much. And you all stay safe, take care of each other. And I will now see you next time. Okay. And thank you so much for uh, joining me. And as always, peace and love.